Okay. Looks like a few people are still logging in. Mm -hmm. Good morning, good morning, everyone. Brian, how do you want to go about it? Do you want to just, um, you want us to go through our questions or are you just going to tackle and then we can jump in? Um, why don't you just go through the questions then so you can, because you sent me the list, but it's probably easier if one of you just reads them and then can tweak them and add things along the line. Sure thing. Well, I guess the um, first one that I have on here is how is there already a vaccine for COVID, but not HIV or cancer? Um, well, this is a really complicated question to answer because uh, the challenge here is we're talking about different, very different types of diseases. Um, COVID is simple and straightforward when it comes to vaccine production. It's one virus that causes uh, that disease. With HIV, the virus attacks the immune system. So the normal things that we would do to create a vaccine don't really work in that case. We've been trying to do it for decades. We're just not there yet. When it comes to cancer, uh, we like to think of cancer as one disease, but it's really a combination of a lot of different diseases, different causes, different ways that it's spread, different cell types, things like that. So uh, it's not quite as simple doing it for cancer. It's something that, that we're working on. Uh, we're just not there yet though, because it's a much more complicated situation. So in this case, it's a, an easier disease to develop a vaccine for. Perfect. I think that was a great rundown for us to use whenever we're out in person. Um, next one I have, um, this has been a, a large concern that we've been hearing from the community, is somebody saying, I have underlying health conditions. Should I be concerned about how the vaccine will interact with my condition or my medications? Well, of course you should be concerned. It's your health. So obviously you want to do what's right for you. But what we know about this vaccine is that it's safe and effective. And so when it comes to the safety, in the clinical trials, they tested it against a broad cross-section of people, people with different underlying conditions on different medications, different health problems. So we kind of looked at all that. We've also given out billions of doses of this vaccine right now and have not seen any problems since we've been using it in the real world. The other thing to think about is because you have underlying health conditions, it's even more important that you get vaccinated because I'd be more concerned about how the virus would interact with my underlying health conditions and medications and all that than I would the vaccine. So when we talk about the safety of a vaccine, just like any medication, no, med no vaccine is 100% perfectly safe. Um, what we have to look at is the dangers caused by the vaccine versus the dangers caused by the disease itself. And so it's really a comparison sort of thing. Um, and the vaccine is much, much, much safer than getting the disease naturally. And so even if it did cause some health problems, it's still very much safer to get the vaccine than it is to get the natural disease. Okay. Um, next one. Um, and if anybody has anything to add or they want to elaborate, feel free to jump in. Um, I already have like a preset of questions listed out. Um, so I'm just going down that as we go along. Um, but next one, uh, what's the point of getting vaccinated if you can still get sick? Should we be concerned uh, about breakthrough infections post-vaccination? Well, I would say, what's the point of wearing a seatbelt if you could still die in a car accident? Mm -hmm. The idea is you're trying to reduce your risk. It's not going to be perfectly protective. We know that, but it's going to provide very significant protection against you getting infected in the first place. And the other thing we've seen with it is if people do get infected after being vaccinated, they tend to have a mild illness that doesn't result in hospitalization or death. So even if you do get sick, you're not going to die from this disease. And so there's multiple benefits from this vaccine. Um, in terms of post-vaccination uh, breakthrough infections, they do happen. No vaccine is perfect. We see this with all vaccines. Um, it can happen that you get vaccinated and your body just didn't mount the right immune response or something like that and you wind up getting the disease. But that's not a reason to avoid the vaccination because those sort of things are rare. And if we look at all the hospitalizations that have occurred over the last two months, nine, over 99% of those have happened in people who are not vaccinated. So it makes a huge difference, not just in getting the disease, but in the outcomes that you'll have if you do get infected. Quick uh, question, if I may, are there any uh, patterns in, in the uh, post-vaccination breakthroughs as to like, are there existing uh, 
uh, health condition those folks may have had or? Um, we haven't had a lot of cases. I haven't seen the analysis on that yet, the, the full details. The, the problem with that is we have to do very detailed investigations to look for those sort of things. And I just don't think we have that data. We don't do those full detailed investigations. It would probably require a special study. I'm sure somebody's working on that. But uh, the amount of information we'd have to collect in our routine surveillance just makes it kind of an unreasonable thing to do as part of just our regular investigations. But I have not seen any reports of particular patterns or anything like that, uh, any certain groups that are more likely to get it or anything along those lines. Any other questions on that one? All right, next one. I think I've heard this a couple of times. People are asking, what are variants? Should I be concerned if I'm vaccinated? And should I be concerned if I'm unvaccinated? And I know you kind of already touched that on the, the last one, but. <laughs> uh, sure. So, so when a virus copies itself, um, the copy is not perfect. Think of it like making a photocopy and then a photocopy of the photocopy. And over time, it kind of degrades, right? The same sort of thing happens when a virus will copy itself. It's not necessarily perfect. It gets these random changes throughout the virus. Now, most of the time, those random changes don't do anything. Sometimes they will be uh, such a major change that it makes that virus uh, die and not even, not even multiply anymore. But every once in a while, one of those changes uh, changes the proteins on the surface of that virus and allows it to spread more easily. And that's what we've seen. So we get these occasional changes that occur. Um, and that's just essentially the evolution of the virus. That's how the virus reprodu reproduces. Um, and those changes over time can result in these slight differences in the structure of the virus, which changes the way it spreads from person to person. Uh, so the variants we've seen, the ones that we're concerned about are ones that make it much easier to spread from person to person. So given the, the same exposure with the virus that we saw a year ago and the virus we're seeing now, like the Delta variant, the Delta variant just spreads more easily to another person. It's easier to infect someone else. So the virus is changing and it, it allows it to spread more easily, which is obviously a challenge for how we control things. Um, should you be concerned if you're unvaccinated? Absolutely, because you're more likely to get uh, infected if you're exposed to somebody. If you're vaccinated, um, this is something we don't fully understand. From what we've seen with the vaccines, uh, they do protect against the variants. The way I describe it is uh, your immune system will recognize that virus, but it doesn't recognize it in such a specific way that it's one single change makes it unrecognizable. So think of it like you recognizing one of your friends. They do their hair differently, they put on makeup, they get a nose job, something like that. You still recognize them because you recognize them in general and those slight changes don't make uh, a, a difference in the ability to recognize it at all. It may make it a little harder to recognize, but it doesn't make it so that the, your body doesn't recognize it. Um, so the vaccines still work against these variants. All the ones that we've seen, they still work. It may work a little less, but they still work. And so you still get protected. Uh, but as we see these new variants show up, that's where the, the concern is starting to come in and where we're starting to try and figure out how do we get things under control? The World Health Organization is recommending that people wear masks indoors. The CDC hasn't made that recommendation. The goal is ultimately to get everybody vaccinated. The masks were kind of our stopgap measure to get us to everybody being vaccinated. Um, and so the real push is to get everyone vaccinated right now, which provides protection at the, the community level. and um, so I would say I, if you're unvaccinated, yes, you should definitely be concerned and get vaccinated. If you're vaccinated, um, we haven't seen a variant the vaccine doesn't work against yet, but if it does spread more easily, this could cause problems down the road. Um, it's, sorry, this popped into my head while you were um, discussing that and I didn't write it down, but um, do the vaccines prevent me from infecting others? Um, this is one of the things we're still trying to understand. So uh, the vaccines make it less likely for you to have a disease with symptoms. It is easier for you to spread the disease if you're coughing and sneezing and you have all those symptoms. We've seen all along in the pandemic, the people with the asymptomatic infections uh, are less likely to spread it in their household. So right there, that alone, the fact that it's changing the way the disease pre presents in you means you're less likely to spread it to other people if it causes that asymptomatic infection. Um, but we don't exactly understand how that transmission works from uh, people who are infected with the asymptomatic disease and all that. We're still trying to understand that. Uh, it's likely to reduce it. I don't know if it eliminates it, but um, when you start to vaccinate everybody, it can stop that transmission in the community. And that's what we're really working toward. 
Other quick question related to that. Say there is a home with, uh, you know, in many minority communities, there are these uh, multi-generational homes. Um, say everybody in that household has been vaccinated. Is it still suggested for folks to wear masks when out in public to decrease the likelihood for older adults with uh, compromised immune systems? So the CDC has not made that recommendation yet. The CDC has not said that vaccinated people need to wear masks out in public. Uh, the only time they've said anything about it is if you're at a large concert or something like that, maybe where there's a lot of people crammed together. Um, but for the most part, they have not said that. The World Health Organization has though, um, but a lot of that has to do with the targets of the information. CDC is targeting a country where we have, uh, even though we don't have the vaccination rates we want, we vaccinated 40% of our population to 50% in some areas. The vaccine's available for everybody as opposed to other countries where it may not even be available. Um, and so it's really kind of just different approaches. They're saying different things that may change over the next few weeks as we see more of that Delta variant spread, but they haven't taken that step of saying wear a mask out in public yet. But if people want to, um, you know, that could potentially reduce any, any risks that's there from these new variants. There's nothing wrong with wearing the mask if you decide you want to. You know, it's not going to cause any problems. At least on our social media post, um, we get a lot of hate for, from our COVID stuff. And we still get a ton of pushback on the effectiveness of masks. What are some like, what are some good things we could share with people about that? And I know we're never going to convince everybody, but it's still, it's still such a debate. Yeah. Um, basically, you can ask people, do they cover their nose and mouth when they cough or sneeze around others, or do they just sneeze in somebody else's face? That's the whole idea of wearing the mask. It's not perfect, but it's going to reduce transmission, even if it just cuts things in half. That's still a lot. If you look at the population level, we could cut the cases in half. That's a big deal. Even a 10% reduction would be a big deal. So that's that's really the challenge right there. Um, if you don't want to wear a mask, get vaccinated. You don't have to worry about it. But then, of course, some people don't want to wear a mask, don't want to get vaccinated. There are people you are never going to be able to convince. They've decided that the mask will suffocate them uh, it won't allow oxygen through, but somehow it'll allow the virus to go right through, which is much, much bigger than an oxygen molecule. You hear these just insane things that make absolutely no sense at all. I've been fighting that for the last year and a half, and it's really frustrating. Um, at least at this point, you can say, well, that's, you know, the whole point of the mask was to get us to a level where our population was vaccinated and protected. And so if we have everybody vaccinated, the masks are unnecessary. And that's hopefully where we'll wind up uh, at shortly. Uh, we're making slow progress, we're still making progress. Thank you. Okay, um, I think the next few that I have are just some concerns that we continue to hear. Um, the first one is the vaccines contain microchips and metals and magnets and all of the above. These are, very, <laughs> these are very difficult things to counter because there's a lot of dumb stuff out there on social media. The microchip one's been around for a year before the vaccine even existed. Um, you know, people are posting these things about a, a chip in the vaccine that's tracking them from their cell phones, which actually is tracking them every single minute of every day. You know, I can know where you're at all the time, what you do, what you search for. Give me your search history and your location. I can tell you pretty much everything about you. Um, and they're worried about a microchip in their body. It, it's really difficult to make that argument that there's no such thing. If you look in the vaccine, you can't see it. Even if we wanted to, we have not been able to minor, miniaturize technology to that size where the microchip could even work and have enough power to transmit to anywhere or anything like that. So um, the other thing you can say is we microchip pets all the time and it's not something that's uh, not noticeable. It's a, you know, the size of a grain of rice or something. It's, you see it going in. It's not like it's this tiny little liquid and that tiny little needle that's going into your arm. So with the microchip, hopefully that one we've gotten past it, but you still do hear those arguments from time to time. Um, the metals and the magnetic one is the newest garbage that's out there. Somebody had a uh, video on social media where they showed a magnet sticking to their skin or something after vaccination, which it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, the amount of, you know, if, if if we inject an iron into you to try to make you magnetic, um, you have more than that in your blood circulating your body. You know, there's your body's full of iron. I should be able to hold a magnet up to somebody who's unvaccinated and it should stick to them if that's how it worked, but it doesn't. Um, it's just something that that was a, a social media post that unfortunately took on a life of its own. And the CDC on their myths page, that's actually the first myth about, no, it doesn't make you magnetic. Um, you know, I don't know 
I don't know why people want to believe that, but they do. And it's just a, an insane sort of thing to try and deal with. I think, unfortunately, with those sort of arguments, um, people are not looking for scientific rationale as to why this one is false or true. And then they'll say, oh, it's not magnetic. OK, I'll go get vaccinated now. Um, they have a list of things that they're using to not get vaccinated. And if you shoot one of those down, the next one will pop up. I call it bullshit whack-a-mole. You kill one of those arguments and the next one just pops right up. And so it's very difficult to make those kind of arguments with people because they're not looking for a rational discussion. They've lined up 50 different reasons to not get vaccinated. And if you knock all 50 of those down, they're just gonna add 50 more. So is the strategy here, if they talk it, we just need to step to the side and let them go with it? The point you got to decide is it is it worth your time you know at, at a certain point there are some people you are just not going to be able to convince and they will take up all of your time where you could better spend that time talking to people who have legitimate questions who are at least receptive to to getting some new information you know if it's a conspiracy theorist who's not going to get vaccinated no matter what um no amount of education is going to change that and that's why we have to take other approaches and make things mandatory and, and, and do some different things there. But there are some people that I think we just have to admit we are not going to change their minds. Or if we are, um, we spend six weeks of time convincing one person when we could have spent time convincing a lot of people and make a big difference. So I won't, so I won't be getting any superhero powers anytime soon. Unfortunately, no. If that were the case, we'd see people like that all over the world. Uh, you know, we've, right. we've vaccinated billions of people and uh, we would That's see... So at least one person who had some superhero abilities. <laughs> Brian, is, is there any discussion about making the vaccines mandatory? Um, the only discussion I've seen about it being mandatory is for kids because we have a, a framework in place that allows us to add vaccines to the, uh, the vaccines necessary to enter schools. So, and she has said that they are going to mandate the vaccine once it has full FDA approval. Okay. So um, I know we'll talk about this in a little bit, the difference between EUA and, and the full approval. Um, but once it gets the full approval, then it can just go through the normal process. It goes to the Board of Regents, and then they have to have a change to the NAC. So it's going to take a lot of time to actually do that. Um, that's where the discussion has occurred about it being mandatory. When it comes to the general population, first, we don't have laws in place typically that mandate vaccination. Uh, we did a century ago, but we don't anymore. And so we would have to start from scratch and put laws in place that required people to get vaccinated. And then you'd have to have some sort of penalty that goes along with it. You know, how would you enforce that? If people are unvaccinated, is somebody going door to door and saying, let me see your information that shows you're vaccinated? Well, no, that's all you do at school. You can check people's records when they go into school. And so we have a way to, to do something about it. And then there's a penalty if you don't, you can't go to school. But it's not the same thing with adults. Would we say, well, you can't renew your driver's license or something like that? What would we do? Would we put the burden on employers then to say all your employees have to be vaccinated? Those things would be huge challenges. Um, and so the discussions that I've seen nationwide, I don't think anybody's pushing for that. It's one of those things like from a public health standpoint, makes perfect sense, seems straightforward. It's just making that happen would be an absolute nightmare. And um, legally, it's going to be a huge challenge because those laws would have to be implemented in each individual state and states are going to do them differently. There would be no federal law because um, it's not something that the feds have control over. Each state would have to make their own decisions, which from what we see in the politics, there's a bunch of states who are already saying, no, they wouldn't. Okay. So that was a really long answer to say, no. <laughs> Thank you though. <laughs> we appreciate the explanation. Um, next one, uh, vaccines contain fetal tissue or the vaccines use fetal tissue. So this has been a big ethical argument, uh, not just for the COVID vaccine, but for the last 20 or 30 years or so, when some people are um, against vaccinations because of their stance on abortion. And uh, they've made the argument that fetal uh, tissue from aborted fetuses was used to create these stem cell lines. And these stem cell lines are used extensively in biomedical research. And therefore getting vaccinated with these vaccines basically supports the results of abortion. Um, and so that is the ethical argument that people are making. And this is a very difficult one 
to, to deal with. Now, depending on the vaccine, um, the mRNA vaccines were not developed using fetal tissue. However, some of the testing that occurs uses these cell lines that we have all over the place, which um, may have maybe cell lines that have that, that origin. So it has been a major challenge to come up with a vaccine that doesn't, uh, that's not touched by the fetal tissue in some way. The, um, what I would do is essentially refer to the viewpoints or the, the papers that have been put out by a lot of the, um, a lot of the major religions. Uh, so a number of Catholic bishops put out uh, a discussion of this particular issue and the Pope talked about it and said, um, even though there may be some connection to abortion, it is very far removed. There is this huge benefit to it. So um, it's still ethical to get this vaccine. It's still your ethical duty to get this vaccine to protect other people. And at the same time, we should pressure the manufacturers to come up with vaccines where we don't have to worry about this particular problem. Um, so it, it's one of those things, there was a lot of information out there about it, and um, it's something that's kind of gone back and forth, but every major religious organization has basically fallen on the side of, yeah, I mean, I, there's an ethical issue here potentially, but it's minor compared to how much good we can do for the people around you, and so they still encourage everyone to get vaccinated. Uh, it's the, you know, the Catholic Church is still encouraging people to get vaccinated, even if there is this connection, because they've evaluated all of it and said, um, you know, this is this is so important that we need to do this. And then, of course, we want to change things for the future, but that shouldn't prevent you from getting vaccinated. Okay. Next one. Um, I don't need the vaccine if I've already had COVID. This is a common one. I've heard this one a lot. Um, COVID gives you immunity to the virus. However, the immunity that's produced by natural infection is a lot weaker than that produced by the vaccine. So you are at much uh, greater odds of being reinfected if you're relying on that natural immunity versus the immunity caused by the vaccine. With the vaccine, we can give you a much higher dose of the proteins that your body responds to so we can elicit a much stronger immune response. And that's what we want people to do. The CDC says to get vaccinated even if you've already had COVID and you can get it as vaccinated as soon as you are out of your isolation period for that disease. So, you know, 10 days after the onset of your symptoms, you can go and get vaccinated that soon after because uh, that will give you a very strong immune response and protect you for the future. It will be a stronger and a more long lasting immunity. So even if you've had the disease, you should get vaccinated. Um, do you think, I don't know how to word this one, but some people, even if they've been infected, they're at least, do they need to complete the dosage or the, the series? Yeah, we haven't really looked at it of what happens if you had natural disease plus one shot. Um, basically just get both doses. There's no reason not to get that second dose because mm -hmm. then you'd be considered fully immunized and protected against it. It's gonna give you the strongest protection. It's not saying there's no protection with a single shot plus natural disease, but um, two shots are easy to get. It's safe and effective. So why not get the second one and be certain that you're actually protected? All right. And then I just got a question sent in to me. Um, what are some facts to share with young people? especially with the Delta variant. I think young people have a, it only impacts adults and seniors mentality. Yeah, that's, that's one of the challenges. Um, the highest rates of disease are in younger people. So if you look at our age breakdown in Southern Nevada, the highest rates of infection have been in people from 18 to 40 or so. And so they're getting infected at higher rates than the older people. Now the outcomes for them are not as bad. They typically are less likely to be hospitalized and less likely to die. But to have a virus that can still cause hospitalization and death, even if it's at a lower rate, why would you wanna take that risk? Um, and even if you don't wind up being hospitalized, this disease can last for a while. There are people, the, the COVID long haulers, uh, the people who wind up being infected with it and weeks or months later, they're still dealing with the symptoms at some level. So this is something that can last for quite a while. If you don't have to get it, why would you take that risk? If it were something you got and you recovered a day later, 
that's going to be a little different. But this thing can really knock you on your butt for quite a while and cause really serious long-term respiratory problems. Even if you're not hospitalized, you can have de decreased lung capacity and things like that. There's myocarditis. There's other things that can happen with it that, that can be a concern for younger people. So even though the risk is lower, it's not a zero risk situation. It's kind of the same thing with influenza. People think that you know, it's only old people that get influenza and die from it. Well, that may be true. Flu is going to make you sick for three weeks. You're going to be out of work for a while. You're going to feel miserable. It's going to take a long time to recover. So even if you're not going to have the serious disease that puts you in the hospital, why would you want to have the disease at all? We've been hearing um, from some of our community partners um, recently that they've, been, they've surveyed some of their membership. And um, there's been a lot more discussion about how to talk to kids about the vaccine and tips for that. Um, Cause it seems like particularly in some of our Latinx community um, that has be become really kind of come to the surface about how do we talk to our kids about the vaccine and, and how do we encourage parents to encourage their kids to get vaccinated? Yeah, that's a huge challenge, especially with kids under 12 not being able to get vaccinated right now. So you could have, you know, the, the older siblings are in high school and they can get vaccinated and the younger siblings aren't that age and they can't get vaccinated. So you have kind of some of the kids in the household potentially vaccinated, but it's, well, they don't have to get it, so I'm not going to. And, and that's going to be a challenge right there. It's also a different kind of disease in uh, depending on the age group. So if you look at the youngest kids, I can see why parents wouldn't be as excited to get their kids under five years of age vaccinated or something like that. By the time you reach high school, you're basically, uh, you're a fully grown adult and your immune system is, is developed to the point where you're still gonna be infected and spread things the same way as everybody else. So with the youngest kids, it's a little different and we have those issues. This will really come up with back to school, um, deciding how many kids you can put in a classroom and do they have to wear masks and all those kind of things. Um, treating the high school kids differently makes perfect sense because their, their bodies are essentially like adults, their immune systems are like adults. Um, but this has really been a tough thing to get across. Kids are not dying from it. There are occasional deaths, but not many. Uh, the kids tend to have very mild disease. Uh, it really comes down to a, a, first of all, a comparison of the risk, showing that it's still much safer to get the the vaccine than it is the disease itself. And, you know, for the parents, do you want your kid home sick for three weeks? You know, they've been home for the last year and a half. Do you want them to miss a month of school because they've got COVID and now they're at home again? Uh, so there's that practical argument you could make for it. Um, but you can also talk about their role in transmission. So it's not just that they get sick and that's the end of it, especially in the multi-generational households. If you go to school and get sick and bring it home, you can infect and kill one of your grandparents. And you don't want that to happen. So, um, so those are some of the arguments you can try and make with those families that it's, you know, it really affects the entire household. It's not just that one kid and having as many people vaccinated as possible is gonna provide the best protection for the, the family unit that's living together as well. It is a, a very difficult thing to do. And I think as we have the vaccine approved, uh, the clinical trials are going on right now for under for basically six months to 12 uh, years of age. Once that is approved, I think we'll hear a lot more discussion of this particular issue. I was interviewed on it yesterday on Channel 8, so they're starting to talk about it at least. But as this becomes a vaccine that all kids can get, um, I think it'll be an easier conversation to have because it'll be something all the schools are talking about and everybody's talking about. Right now, it's just a little more difficult because we're not quite at that point. Do we have a timeline on that yet? We don't. Um, the, the upside to seeing this fourth surge and a lot more people getting infected is it makes the clinical trials a little easier because what you have to do is vaccinate half the group, the other half gets a placebo and you let them get naturally exposed. Well, if there's no natural disease transmission, it takes a long time to have enough cases in the, uh, in the placebo group to be able to compare against. But the more disease we see in the community, the easier it is to make that comparison. So hopefully that will speed things up again. The other uh, parts of the trial took four to six months or so to get enough cases in there until they could say um, they were going for it. And they've been doing it. They started recruiting about a month or two ago. So they're in the trials now, but it's just going to take some time. Um, I, it's not going to be before back to school this year. Um, maybe it'll be for the, the spring semester, but it's definitely not going to be back to school this fall. Um, another question that came in, what kind of response would you give to the people that compare the vaccine to testing on the Tuskegee Airmen? Um, we're talking about completely different sorts of situations. 
so the, the Tuskegee syphilis study was something that was very, very different. It was ethically wrong, but in a different direction. So what happened in the Tuskegee experiment was it was a natural study of men infected with syphilis. And the plan was to track them over their lives because there wasn't a treatment. We wanted to know how syphilis progressed which is a perfectly reasonable thing to study. The problem is once the antibiotics became available, uh, instead of actually treating all those people, they allowed them to remain infected and follow them over time. So basically they withheld treatments, a completely unethical thing to do, completely wrong. Uh, this is something that's very, very different. Right now, what we're talking about is a, a vaccine that we have been trying to be as transparent and as public about throughout this entire process. We went through the clinical trials, all that information has been released. It's approved by the FDA, everybody knows about it. And now we are encouraging people to get vaccinated. We're not mandating anything. We're not tricking them in anything. We're not withholding treatment. We are trying to do something that will actually protect people and make this available to everybody. So, um, so they, they fall into the same issue of ethics, but they're very, very different situations and they're not really comparable. Thank you. Another question, can pregnant women get vaccinated when we recommend that they seek out a medical professional's advice? What is it that profession, what is that professional looking for? History of an allergic reaction? So there's really no difference between a, a pregnant woman and a woman who's not pregnant when it comes to the vaccine. Um, if there is some particular medical reason they think it would be unsafe to give uh, that person the vaccine, they're not going to do it. But the only things that we've seen so far as contraindications are if you are allergic to any of the components of the vaccine. It doesn't matter if you're pregnant. It doesn't matter what underlying conditions you have. Uh, in fact, we want pregnant women to get vaccinated. We found the uh, some of the studies have been published, they actually can pass on that immunity to the, the newborn, which is something we see uh, the maternal antibodies there. Um, so it provides some temporary protection against the COVID to the newborn, which is awesome. Um, so really, if you're pregnant, this vaccine is not a live vaccine. Usually what happens, uh, we're, we're very cautious about using a live vaccine with pregnant women because of uh, problems that can be caused by the virus multiplying in their body. So like we won't give the MMR vaccine to a pregnant woman because the rubella shot can cause serious problems. This is something that's very, very different. There is no contra contraindication against pregnancy. And we strongly encourage pregnant women to get it, especially because your immune system kind of ramps down a little bit when you're pregnant to help protect that developing fetus. Um, we don't want you to get sick while you're pregnant. And so we encourage pregnant women to get it more than uh, to the average person because their risk goes up a bit. Thank you. All right, I am back to the list now, but if anybody thinks of any questions, you can send them in to me or you can feel free to ask. Um, so this is a concern that I hear, uh, especially see it on social media. People are calling, saying it's a shot, not a vaccine. And I think that goes back to the, the bullheaded people that you can't convince them of anything, but. <laughs> Well, a, a shot is the mechanism of getting it into your body. The vaccine is what we're injecting into you. Um, so they're really two different things. If you want to argue the, the terminology, you can try it. It doesn't really mean anything. Uh, we're talking about giving you an injection of a vaccine. Um, and so it absolutely is a vaccine. We are injecting you through a needle and syringe with the vaccine. That's how this is given. So uh, I don't know how to really argue with that. But I mean, it's it, they're trying to argue something that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to begin with. I don't quite understand that. Yeah, me either. Um, and then I know we kind of touched on this also, but I guess with the kids, but with adults, I'm healthy, so I don't need to get vaccinated. We have seen healthy adults get sick, be hospitalized, and die from this virus for the last year and a half. It doesn't take much to go online and find stories about somebody in your community that was otherwise young and healthy and vibrant and a runner or an athlete or something like that, and they got COVID and they died. COVID really doesn't care if you're healthy right now. COVID can infect anybody, and you may have underlying conditions that you haven't identified yet. You may have some problems that, you know, as we get older, those things come to light, um, but people have different immune systems, different challenges in their bodies and things like that. And so the risk from the natural disease is still so much greater than any risk that you could get from the vaccine that it makes sense to get vaccinated to protect yourself. 
I had a quick question. Why do you think it is that Nevada has the highest transmission rate out of any state in the nation? Um, our vaccination rate sucks. We have everything open at 100%. Nobody is wearing masks and we have the Delta variant spreading here. You put all those things together, it gives us kind of that perfect storm situation to allow transmission. Um, not that other states don't have that same situation. Some of them have much better vaccination rates so they don't have those same issues. Uh, Missouri is having major problems with it as well. If you look at the states with the worst vaccination rates, you're going to see more disease. Uh, give it two or three weeks and another state will be number one. This has happened through the higher pandemic. There's always a hot spot somewhere because it, think of it like the spread of a fire during a forest fire. Um, it's not constant. Some places flare up, some calm down. And right now we're one of the flare ups. So those four factors were low vaccination rate, the Delta variant, uh, no masks, and what else? And 100% open, no restrictions on any, uh, any stuff around people. Thank you. All right. We have a question um, going on into the FDA approval. So I guess we'll bring up the, what's the difference between emergency use authorization and FDA approval? And then um, compounding onto that, is there a timeline for when the vaccine will be FDA approved? Are there any changes happening so the vaccine can be approved? So the FDA allow, has a normal process for approving a particular uh, biologic product that's going to be used in humans. And it normally can take 10 months or so for that process to occur. There's an expedited process, but that's still a six month process or so. But they recognize that there are certain situations where the threat to our population is so great, they want to quickly approve things. Uh, and that's where the emergency use authorization is allowed for those types of life-threatening situations where we don't have the time to do the 10-month process. Uh, it still requires that we, we show evidence uh, that it's safe and effective. We have to run clinical trials just like we would in uh, with any other medication. But once those trials are done, it's, it's an expedited process to approve things. They also don't require as much information from the, uh, the, the drug manufacturers. With a regular clinical trial, they may say, hey, go back and do this. And it takes longer because they want to follow up on rare things or do something like that. Um, so basically you try to balance out the, the, the risk to the population with any risk from speeding up the process. And so in this case, the emergency use authorization allowed them to quickly approve the vaccine for use in the, the overall population. Now, when, an EUA, when it's approved under EUA, there's all sorts of rules that go along with it. And one of those is you can't require that anybody gets an EUA approved medication. Um, it's something because it's still kind of experimental sort of. Um, it's, not, it's not fully approved by the FDA. It has been approved, scientists reviewed it, they've done the studies and all that, but they still have to do that full process. And that's what they've started on to get the full FDA approval for it. It just takes time to do that. And the problem is if we wanna speed that up, people are gonna say, well, we rushed through the, the full process too. So we kind of have to do that longer process and say, we, we gave it the very thorough examination. Now, the thing that feeds into this thorough examination is after the EUA, we started vaccinating people. So we've given out tens of millions of doses in the United States. And we have all of that data on the experience of what happens when you vaccinate you know, half a billion people to say, yes, this is a, a safe and effective vaccine. Um, it just takes a long time to go through that process. They are doing it, but uh, if you think about it from the manufacturer's standpoint, they don't really need to do it. They need to for, you know, ultimately need to do it, um, but it would make more sense that they're trying to get all the studies done on younger kids so they can get it approved for them before they get the full licensing package going forward. Um, and so they're working through all these things kind of in parallel. They're doing additional studies. They're following up on any problems we found uh, from vaccination under the EUA, um, but it's it's something that, that they're going for. It's just a longer, more deliberate process, but there's no reason to think they're going to find something different and say, whoops, we screwed up. Uh, you know, we've been using this vaccine for a while now, and it has been shown to be safe and effective. Is there like a, sorry if you mentioned it, is there like a timeline or um, when there's an ETA for the full approval for it? I have not seen a timeline. I've seen that the companies are moving in that direction. Basically, you, ha you have to submit a lot more stuff to the FDA. So okay. they're putting that together, not just from the original clinical trials, but everything from all the, the data that's been collected after people were vaccinated, the additional clinical trials and people over 12 years of age. And all. They have to put all of that together into one giant submission for this vaccine. 
Okay. All right, moving on. I guess we're on to our other questions now. Um, Nevada has had political pressure to reopen to 100% capacity despite not meeting the state's vaccination goal from a purely epidemi epidemiological standpoint. What should or shouldn't we be doing in Clark County? This is a tough question for me to answer with a lot of without a lot of uh, profanity because this is the thing I've kind of struggled with over uh, quite some time. Um, honestly, we reopened too soon and too quickly and people didn't ease into anything. They just said, hey, COVID's gone. Let's go out and do whatever we did. Like COVID doesn't exist. That's really been the huge challenge here is we've had uh, people just kind of rushed into everything. So at this point, there aren't a lot of options as to what we can do in Clark County. The purpose of masks was basically the bridge between where we were at and having everybody vaccinated. Um, now that we have the vaccine here, that's what we're still trying to do. And so um, we've also been backed into a corner by the, the CDC guidance on masks. When CDC put out their new mask guidance, it screwed everybody. It made it so that we couldn't keep our mask mandate in place because the science made perfect sense. If you were vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask because the, the risk to you is very low and the risk to others is very low. The problem is there is no way to differentiate who was vaccinated and who wasn't. So because of the way that they did that, it was good science and public policy that was impossible to implement. And so if you, if you go out anywhere, we know that 40% of the population in Nevada is fully vaccinated. But are 60% of the people you see in public wearing masks? No, maybe five or 10%, depending where you go. Like if you go to Walmart, there was nobody there. I went to Target yesterday, you saw a lot more masks, uh, just different uh, crowds, I think. But still, it was way less than that 60% of people wearing the mask that, that we should see. So really, from the, the only other options we have are to start closing things down again. And that's an easy one to say from a public health standpoint, but then there's the whole economic side of that, the giant mess that we've just gone through. So it is a a very difficult situation to navigate for a politician. The pressure to reopen to 100% has been there since day one. Uh, I don't think the governor cared about that. The day he put the mask mandate in place, everybody was saying we should reopen 100%. You saw Carolyn Goodman's stupid comments about using Las Vegas as, a, uh, as guinea pigs and all that kind of stuff. We've had that pressure all along. The governor kept the mask mandate in place for about a year, despite that political pressure. So it, it was just one of those things that Politically, uh, that's the way it worked out and we're kind of stuck where we are right now. So it, it doesn't really matter what we should be doing epidemiologically at this point, it's not going to happen. So really all we can do right now is try to improve our vaccination rates to help get things under control. Uh, and that's where all of our effort is going. And that's, that's really the best thing we can do. We want everybody vaccinated. I would love to see people wearing masks a lot more, but I just don't think it's realistic. It's not like that's something we're gonna be able to go back to politically. Um, next one, I know we kind of like touched on this in bits and pieces of a previous question, but how were the COVID-19 vaccines developed so quickly? And this is one that we get asked a lot from our partners. So yes, the vaccine was developed quickly. However, it was only developed quickly because we had decades worth of work that allowed us to put a system in place that could produce this vaccine quickly. The parts of the vaccine were things that we've been using in drugs for a long time. So mRNA uh, is something that we've been working with for a long time. We, we can manipulate it more quickly now than we could a decade ago or two decades ago. The, the science has improved so much where we can do these things overnight. We can sequence uh, the virus in an hour or so. You put the little sample in a machine and it gives you results. It used to take weeks of work to do the sequence for one virus. And that was just the time since I was in an undergrad studying biology. So in, in 25 years, it's changed where we're just really fast at, at doing things with genetic material. But the, the lipid, uh, the liposomes that it's basically in, those are things that we've been developing for drugs for the last couple of decades. So we had all these pieces, we had a system set up, we had a process that allowed us to produce mRNA vaccines. And this was our chance to use that process. So basically we've spent a couple decades building the factory essentially to produce these vaccines. And now that we have that all in place and we've tested all the pieces, it's easy just to change the instructions and say, give me this particular vaccine. Right now, if we wanted to produce a completely different mRNA vaccine for something else, we could come up with it in a couple of days. As long as we pick the right genetic sequence, it only takes a couple of days to actually put this together. 
but that stands on the shoulders of decades of work to get to this point. So it's not that we produced it overnight. What they saw were the last week's work of a multiple decades process to get to this point. So it looks like it's really fast, but we've been doing this for a very long time uh, to get us ready. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the firemen can arrive right away when you call them, when you call 911. Yes, but it took years of work to build a fire station and train people and have trucks and all of that stuff ready to go. It's not like the, they built the fire department to respond to your fire. They just put things in motion right then. And that's what we did with this vaccine. Um, what is mRNA? mRNA is messenger RNA. And so you have, uh, you have DNA in your body uh, and that's kind of the library of how to produce everything that your body needs. And what happens is you make essentially a copy of that DNA, it turns it into mRNA. And then that mRNA is then put into all the machinery that makes the proteins or whatever it, it needs. So if your body needs to produce insulin, there's instructions in your DNA on how to make insulin, then messenger RNA basically checks out that information and passes it on to the machinery that, uh, that produces that insulin or whatever it is. When you're infected by the COVID virus, uh, it does the same thing. It hijacks that machinery. It uses messenger RNA to then produce uh, the COVID virus. And so we just took advantage of a system that was already there in your body. And we produced an instruction set, essentially. It says, here's how to make this piece of the virus that your body can then recognize. Uh, so it's just one tiny little protein in your body that we give the, your body the instructions to make. Your body makes a bunch of this protein, and then your immune system can recognize it. So when you're exposed to the natural virus, you can fight it off. Um, what are these side effects? So the side effects, um, the side effects vary from person to person, but for the most part, the most commonly reported side effect is that your arm hurts where somebody gave you a shot. Um, so that's not really a side effect. It's exactly what you expect to happen when you get poked by a needle. It happens every time you get a shot of anything, your arm's going to be sore right there. Um, the side effects, the, the common ones that we see is people feel crappy for about a day. So the day after they get vaccinated, uh, you may run a fever, you kind of feel miserable, uh, you go to bed early that day, you wake up the next day and you're pretty much back to normal. That's been the, the typical experience of people with the vaccine. Your arm may be sore for a couple more days, but uh, typically you just feel kind of crappy for a day or so. Uh, some people, it can last a little longer. There are other uncommon side effects that happen. Uh, if you're allergic to one of the components, obviously that could be a serious problem. You know, if, you're, uh, if you have a major allergic reaction to one of the pieces of the vaccine and we inject you with that, you're gonna have that bad allergic reaction. But for the most part, uh, feeling crappy for about a day is it, which is way better than getting COVID and feeling crappy for weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I will take the short-term inconvenience for the long-term outcome. It Absolutely. <laughs> That's Absolutely. what I've been preaching from day one. Um, so on that, what is in the vaccine? Well, we have a couple of different vaccines. The ones that we talk about the most are the mRNA vaccine. There's actually not much in those vaccines. So you have mRNA. It's packaged inside a little globule of fat, essentially, that allows it to get into your body. Um, and then there's some things from the manufacturing process. There's water in there, a little salt, a uh, tiny little bit of sugar, some things like that. There is really not much in the vaccine, especially compared to some of the other vaccines, because it's because the way we produce this, we don't have to grow the virus up, we don't have to purify it or anything like that. There's not a lot of remnants in the manufacturing process in this, like we see with other vaccines. We also don't put, we don't see antibiotics and preservatives and things like that because this, we preserve this by freezing it, because uh, that's what we have to do to protect the mRNA from degrading. So there's really not a lot in the vaccine that you can react to, especially compared to uh, vaccines that you may have gotten as a kid. Thank you. Um, how's, the, how's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine different than the mRNA then? So the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a, it's a, a virus vaccine that's um, a completely different approach. So the mRNA vaccine, all we're doing is giving you the mRNA. The ultimate goal is the J&J &J vaccine results in mRNA production that does the same thing. So it gets there in the end, uh, but we use a, a carrier virus essentially. We take the genes from uh, from COVID, we put it into that one, and now we can inject your body, and now that virus is used to inject it into the cells, 
and from there it, it takes over the, the normal process. So it's a it's a carrier virus vaccine. We don't really have many of those out there. We have some in the animal world, but like the mRNA vaccine, these are both kind of newer technologies that we use. It's a lot harder. It's a lot harder to explain the carrier virus vaccine, the J and J. But we haven't been using that one as much. Uh, we've been trying to use that for people who. It's really difficult to find them for shot two. You know, if it's if it's people who are in in prison or something. Well, they may be released by the time uh, shot two comes around. So we'd rather give them the one shot or at a homeless camp or something like that. Uh, that's why we've done mRNA just about everywhere else. Um, how how do you respond to somebody saying, I'm allergic to eggs? Is that an excuse? Uh, no. <laughs> and so that's that's a common concern for the flu vaccine because the flu virus is actually grown up in eggs and then it's purified from there. So we use eggs to make the flu virus uh, vaccine. We don't use eggs in the process at all for the COVID vaccine. So it's not something you have to worry about. Even with the flu vaccine, it's kind of a crap excuse because uh, the CDC recommendation is that even if you have that egg allergy, it's not going to be a problem unless it causes an anaphylactic reaction. It's not something you need to worry about for the flu shot. You should still get the flu shot. But in this case, the easy answer is Eggs are not involved in the process of this anyway. The only way you would have any egg exposure is if you went to breakfast and ordered eggs and then went and got your flu shot. I like that. Um, well, we already touched on this of what's the difference between the different vaccines uh, and the, how do the vaccines work? We already kind of went through that. Does the vaccine give you COVID? Absolutely not. So the mRNA vaccine cannot give you COVID. All it's doing is giving you uh, one of the proteins that's on the surface of the virus. It's not all the pieces needed for the virus to spread. Um, basically what it's doing is uh, kind of like if you're trying to recognize a person, it would be a, a copy of a mask of somebody's face. It's not the whole person. Uh, so it cannot multiply. It cannot cause the disease. Uh, it cannot spread to other people. I know a lot of people are concerned about shedding of it or something like that. You are not infected with COVID. You're not shedding anything. You're producing these little proteins in your body that your immune system responds to. So it does not give you COVID-19. Uh, you may feel crappy the next day. That is a normal reaction to the vaccine. It is not COVID uh, and you're not going to spread COVID to other people. Um, how do we know the vaccines are safe and effective, especially for our minority communities? When we did the clinical trials, the whole point of those is to establish the safety and the efficacy of the vaccines. And we want to make sure that the vaccines are safe and effective against a broad cross section of the population. So they did their best to recruit minority populations into those clinical trials so that it does represent all Americans. It wasn't just tried on rich white people in Vermont or something like that. We did it all over the country. We tried to include people from every group to make sure that this was safe and effective in everybody. Um, and so it was done as a, a clinical trial. You can go to the FDA's website and actually read the full results of that clinical trial that talks about the efficacy and the safety of the vaccine. So what we do is we vaccinate a bunch of people, we give the other people a shot of uh, salt water and so they don't have the virus, uh, they don't have the vaccine, and we compare the differences in them. And we found huge differences between the people that got the vaccine and those that didn't. As we have continued to vaccinate people, we are tracking the safety and efficacy uh, when it's used in the real world. So it's one thing to do in a clinical trial with 20,000 people. It's a different thing to do it with hundreds of millions of people around the world. And that's what we've been doing for the last few months. So we have not seen the side effects with any populations. We haven't seen different problems with different populations. Everybody's basically uh, responds to this the same way uh, in terms of both the safety and the efficacy. So the process is there and we've made a very strong effort with this particular issue with minority communities to show that it works with everybody. Uh, it's not just limited to one population. We've tried to be as inclusive as possible in this and we've you know, targeted different populations that we know are having uh, major problems. There's been huge outbreaks on the Navajo reservation. And so we made sure we had a lot of people from Native American communities in the clinical trial to, to try and do that. Now it's always hard to recruit people into trials still, but we have done everything we can to, to make sure that we can show these vaccines are safe and effective for everyone and try to be as transparent as possible about that. Perfect. I know we only have I, I don't know that that will convince anybody, 
But I mean, that's the honest answer. We know that this is an issue. We know this is a concern and we designed it to try and look at those problems so that people would actually trust the vaccine. Right. Okay. And then I know we only have about five minutes left. So if there are any burning questions you guys have, feel free to ask them. Um, I have a few more things on the list that are some concerns that we keep hearing. Um, I think this is one that I like to have is the vaccines will cause infertility because I think that's still. Yeah. So this one came out because there was a, there was an article that was making a claim that one of the little bits of the sequence of the mRNA was similar to the, a certain protein that's found in the lining of the uterus or something like that. And it, it's a really bizarre argument that scientifically these aren't a big word, so it seems like it's something real, but it's kind of like saying there were three words in the Bible as that matched this three word sequence that I found in the Las Vegas Review Journal today. And so there's this ultra there's this Christian conspiracy or something like that. Just because there was some overlap in a few of the, the things that happen out there in the world doesn't mean anything at all. Um, and so here's my argument as to how to deal with that. If they don't believe that the vaccines, uh, any of the results from the vaccines, we have not seen problems with infertility from the virus itself. We have not seen any problems to pregnant women. We haven't seen changes in our birth rates, we haven't had higher rates of stillbirth or miscarriage or anything like that, which would happen if the proteins on the virus itself infecting women when they were pregnant caused infertility. So, so there's zero evidence of that. And it's, it's one of these unfortunate things that we have to keep dealing with. There's no proof of it, but somebody made a connection that was just complete garbage. This is why I don't talk to the public as much because I say smart ass things like that, that, you know, well, sometimes it works. Depends on the audience, I guess. <laughs> We're just going to go around and saying, that's garbage. Dr. Leibniz told us. Come on, to. you saw my article on the masks of the uh, quit your bullshit, put on your mask. I love that. <laughs> one is other there, uh, go ahead, Eric, go ahead. Uh, one last question, if I may, Dr. Leibniz. Um, so you mentioned some important upcoming events like a potential CCESD vaccination requirement, uh, a full FDA approval. What other things should we have on our radar that will be coming across in the pipe? Um, pay attention to anything related to what new variants are out there. And so we have the Delta variant. You'll see a lot of that stuff uh, about the number of people. The, the state put out a technical bulletin yesterday that is requiring all laboratories to submit all their specimens to the state for sequencing. So it sounds like they want to do it for every single person, which means that's going to be a lot more data showing the percentage. I would expect to see the Delta variant will be the majority pretty quickly. It was 46% on the last one. It spreads more easily. So just the, the natural biology of it, it's going to be the dominant strain quickly. Uh, there's also a Delta plus variant out there, which is Delta plus a couple other things. And so as these new variants pop up, they're going to keep happening over and over. So stay on top of the variants, whatever the newest one of the day is, but it's always the same story. It spreads more easily and that's even more reason to get vaccinated and the vaccine still does work against it. Um, what makes so that's, it the other, that's the thing that I've been paying attention to mostly. What variants. makes it spread more easily? Um, basically, the it is a, a change in the surface protein which allows the virus to enter the cell more easily. And so it's just that simple biologic change that now if you're exposed to it, you're more likely to get infected. Thank you. All right. Any any last questions? We're almost to our hour. It goes by so fast. It does. <laughs> I'm a total science nerd. I love all learning all this stuff, even though it's like been what I've been doing for like the past year. And a half. <laughs> so <laughs> well, I'm happy to come back and do this again if there's more questions and stuff, if you want to do another session. So just let me know. I'm happy to help out. Since you're the people out there convincing other people to get vaccinated and making things better for everybody else, uh, I'm always happy to support you in whatever way I can. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Labus. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Did anyone else have a question, comment? Before I guess just up? one last final one. Um, because I've, I've heard two of people's concerns of like, what about five years from now? How, what are you know some long-term effects? You know, could we expect some of those or is there no possibility of having those long-term effects? Well, there's, there's no way to say what's really going to happen five years from now. And if that's the argument people want to make, you know, what happens five, 10, 20 years down the road, that's true for any new medication, any new food, any anything. You don't know what's going to happen down the road. There's no evidence that there's any long-term problems. And because this comes from the virus itself, I would expect that 
whatever long-term problems occur because the vaccine would be identical to those that happen from the virus. And so if the long-term problems are gonna occur, I'd rather have to go through the step of not being hospitalized and not dying <laughs> to get to that point. Um, it's just one of those things, if that's the argument, you know, what happens down the road, that pretty much prevents us from ever doing anything. And you know, that's something we have to keep in mind. Very good, thank you. All right. All right, thanks everyone, this has been fun. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Labus. We'll be Bye, in everyone. touch if, if we need it again. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.